Hello and welcome to episode number 38 of The Closing Track, the podcast where the faith that you believe collides with the music that you love and then some and everything in between. I'm Austin, your host, and I'm joined as always with Aaron. And again, I don't have anything for you. Like, I, I have to remind myself that you're unlike Brett, because uh, Brett is quite the the, the random personality at times. You're a pretty stable and straightforward guy. Like uh, the cleanly shaven Aaron. Not cleanly shaven, but I'm uh, I yeah, I, I did notice that when I walked into church earlier. I was like, he shaved. <laughs> I did, yeah. I, I, need, I need a change up. It'll grow back in two weeks. So, so question then: Does yeah. does Betty prefer clean shaven or or stubble? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. You should probably find that I out. I should find that out, yeah. You, you should probably find that out because that might be that might be a pretty big thing. You it, know? it might be, yeah. You, you know, with the, the renaissance of the beard and facial hair, like, yeah. it's, there are studies that are done on, like, uh, on, like, what do re- women really prefer when it comes to facial hair? And they all contradict each other and they yeah. all say totally different things, but. She actually loves <laughs> a cowboy hat, so I bought a cowboy hat. <laughs> Really? Yeah. And I gotta say, man, I like it. I like the cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot picture this in my head. I'll just have to see it to believe I only it. Wear it. I only wear it whenever I mow the grass. So. Oh, okay. Or when I'm doing work outside. So. Okay. Because that's when cowboy hats are, you know, functional. Yeah. That, that That's when they're really useful, is, you know, keeping the sun off. They of really are pretty amazing. They're, they're really better than a baseball cap, so. I, oh, absolutely. My, my boss my boss wants me to, like, wear baseball caps when I'm out in the hot sun. I'm just like, why? So, like, what's it going to protect my to protect me from? <laughs> my, my forehead from the sun? I get, yeah. I mean, that's, that's all it's going to protect me from. No, at, I mean, wearing cowboy hats, like, for work, that's fine. It's when you're wearing, like, a cowboy hat everywhere you go. Yeah. That's that's just really like stop it. <laughs> well, I'm gonna take it to Puerto Rico. Like I, I thought about like the first time I ever met my in-laws or soon to be in-laws. I didn't do this, but I might do it during Christmas when I go down there again. But I thought about just like decking out in a full like cowboy gear, mm-hmm. like because I already got the boots, man. You do was, have the boots. I got the boots, and I was gonna get. I was gonna bring my cowboy hat. And just could like get get it, get my cinch going on, and then just like totally freak everyone out. That would be hilarious. I remember. Okay, I remember one time I went to uh, New York on a not New York, but we were we passed through New York on the way uh, to a mission trip in high school, and a one of the guys on the team was like super uber hardcore redneck, like couldn't be any more of, of a of a hillbilly. Like it, it was just impossible, and he was like decked out in all of his stuff like walking in like the bronx and walking in like fish out of water that's an understatement man (laughs) like that's such an understatement everybody everybody just gave him the what the crap look (laughs) as he walked by you know and i i've I've made that i i understand yeah i'm dressing more culturally relevant to where we live because it's really com- like cowboy boots are really comfortable i was not a really boot. comfortable i wasn't a boot i mean the boots that i have you can't really call them cowboy boots but i'm not gonna lie my work boots which are you know of a similar style to cowboy boots they're just not the same thing they're really dang awesome mm. like i would wear these all the time and i do wear them all the time just because they're so easy to wear yeah you just slip them on and forget about it no yeah. no don't tripping over shoelaces and and, and, you know, oh, gosh, if I had a dime for every time I tripped over my shoelaces. We'd be... <laughs> you don't have to worry about that with boots. <laughs> no, you really don't. Yeah. And plus, and plus, tennis shoes don't have steel toes, which steel-toed boots mm. may be the greatest <laughs> invention on the planet in terms of, like, in terms of like for work. Yeah, I mean, they've saved my life a few times, or my toes, I guess you They've saved my toes countless countless times uh we've got a great episode planned for you guys today we got uh two reviews one of which uh, i'm really excited about and then another one uh from a band that we haven't really covered on the show before uh and a band that you kind of specialize in aaron <laughs> yeah that, that, that's very accurate you you specialize in this band and yeah. i can't recall any of their stuff ever <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of sad on my part. Uh, and then we're going to get into, uh, we're going to talk about a dead white guy. Like mm. I just, I'm just going to tease it as that. I'm not going to say his name. Mm. I'm not going to say what quote or what book, 
we're going to talk about a, a, a really dead smart guy. Yeah. Colonel well, Sanders. Hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can find us on Facebook at Another Ascending Lark. You can find us on Twitter at AAL Blog. Uh, you can send us an email at Another Ascending Lark at gmail.com. But like I've been saying for the past couple of weeks, only for a little bit longer. Transition is still going really well. We uh, are starting to move stuff off the Another Ascending Lark.com website, and I've begun uh, doing the, the backdoor web design work for our new home, which is going to hopefully be really streamlined and just really focused more on the podcast podcasting element like we like we said that we were going to do we're not trying to make a, a remake another ascending lark we're just trying to make a podcast with a blogging component on the side and that's what it's looking to be at the moment so the transition's going really well i can say that uh probably the next episode is when we will announce uh the the new social media accounts for for this shindig and when we will start phasing out the another ascending lark and uh yeah, just the another ascending mark accounts. So just keep your ear out for that. Like the pages in the meantime if you want to get involved in the question of the week, which we got some answers for this question of the week. And we've got an awesome one for next week as well. So definitely want to stick around for the end of that. So let's get into uh, let's get into reviews. I want to talk about a band that built all of their instruments from scratch. <laughs> That's still like, I can't even imagine the amount of work it had to be to build every instrument on this album from scratch there's a word for that right like whittling oh luthier luthier okay for guitars can you you whittle something can you whittle a guitar (laughs) can you whittle a a tree (laughs) i wonder what this is like like you know what i like that tree i'm gonna cut it down and make something out of it that's 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 really cool that is i want to listen to that album that is manly yeah that is like super man we know a friend we know a friend who builds guitars yes yeah and even with like his his, his rig and his tools, it's taking him, like, a while to yeah. do just one guitar. Mm-hmm. So I can't even imagine, like, not only just building guitars, but, like, even building, like, drums. Like, they built their drums. Wow. Yeah, think about that. Like, holy crap. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, building their drums. I'm talking about a band from Idaho called The Ongoing Concept, which I said last week is one of the more exciting things going on in the 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 christian sector of the metal scene at the moment uh, but i would probably say these guys are tapping into something that hasn't been tapped into until a, a very long time they released their sophomore album called handmade which you know ironically titled they built all of their instruments by hand you know you know there's a there's a tie in there and wow 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 this album is all over the place it it is it's got southern rock it's got folk it's got pop it's got dance it's got metal it's got gent it's got everything and it works it's amazing like like let me find a sample here to play it and just like like, uh, just try to blow this out. Of, like, just give you an example here. Oh, uh, here we go. Here's an example from a track called Feel. down you can dance to <laughs> i mean it's it's metal but it's set to a dance beat and it works very unique <laughs> it, it definitely works like th- this band definitely uh taps into family force five have you have you ever done anything with family force five I'm like no oh man no, family force five is such a fun band like they're weird as all oh wait out. i'm thinking of five finger death punch <laughs> <laughs> totally the opposite end of the spectrum there. <laughs> Family Force Five. I've heard of that. Okay. Okay. They're yeah. They're so think. <laughs> you death plan. So Family Force Five. Like they're they're definitely tapping into Family Force Five. Uh, did you ever? You, you might have to think back into this one. Did you ever uh, listen to a band called Jonesetta? 
Mm-mm. Is that Nightmare? Okay, that's a fun band. Oh man, that's a that's a really really fun band. Tapping into a little bit of like Dillinger Escape Plan in, in certain parts. Dillinger of Escape Plan. I oh, know that, I know that reference. Oh yes, there is definitely some some very Dillinger uh, Escape Plan like style moments uh, throughout this album. It starts off with like a, a a hand clap and snaps like intro into the track Amends, which when the the clean vocals come into the opening track it sounds like a michael jackson cover oh, you know what the heck why not let me just prove my point You weren't expecting that turn, were you? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just this album is just all over the place. The, the fourth track, Trophy, has got a very genty feel to it. Soul. This one, Soul, will definitely get uh, them into trouble because it's a song about selling their soul to the devil. Interesting. And they're making nods to, like, the devil went down to Georgia and, you know, just to the general idea of... Uh, selling your soul, you know, to rock and roll, basically. Uh, but they also it, it kind of expand the the boundaries there to just show how uh, we sometimes sell ourselves out to someone who will never deliver what he promises, who, who can never, who will never actually deliver what he says he will deliver because he's a liar. And so it's a, it's actually a very lyrically interesting song. The, the character who's selling his soul is, he's doing it to, he's selling his soul to the devil because he doesn't want to be forgotten. Which, I mean, it's a really interesting idea. Uh, and then track number track number nine. This song has so much energy in it. It's freaking insane. Uh, this track is called Survivor, and it's easily my favorite song, and probably the, one of the best songs on the album. <laughs> just so much so much going on <laughs> yeah but it works and, and that's the thing is that these guys managed to tap into 10 million different sources and it just works i i mean this is phenomenal this is outstanding it's everything and it works wonderfully there's not a single bad track here on this album unless uh well okay the the very first track is like a 51 second inter- intro but that's not really a song that's just an, something but i mean seriously like this album is amazing the, the the mixing is great the the tones and the sounds everything on here is pretty technical at times this is a win like and, and honestly i don't know what great to give it because I, I'm very, very tempted to put this at a 10. It's that good. Really? This, Yeah, and this would make the fifth that I've given a 10 to. Just giving out 10s all the time, man. I, I mean, I don't, yeah, yeah, like, that's a pretty big deal. And so <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to put this at a 9.75 solely because it's got, of the 11 tracks, one of them doesn't really count. There. I'll just say 9.75. Very nice. It has everything, like, to be a album of the year album like this seriously may enter my album of the year list which at the moment consists of like Sufjan Stevens and yeah Sufjan Stevens so Mm -hmm. so I mean this album is phenomenal it's so good I put this on I mean I put this on repeat yesterday and, and worked on the worked on the show and uh the website design for probably about five hours yesterday put it on repeat Never got old for a second. Hmm. Like, did not want to listen to anything else. So, the ongoing concept, handmade. I, I don't think you should listen to this. I don't think it's very good. 
Uh, so, Aaron, Third Eye Blind. I'm like, what's going on with Third Eye Third Blind? Third Eye Blind. Well, can I, let me just talk about Third Eye Blind real quick. You got you to preface like your, your expertise. Yeah, in, let me give you some area. context, some background. So, Austin, whenever I think of Third Eye Blind, I think of my first crush. Okay. 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 I, I, I think of trying to learn the guitar so I can start a band. I, I started listening to Third Eye Blind uh, probably when I was in f- third or fourth grade. Okay. So they, they, they were very, very uh, pivotal for me as far as like discovering my love for music. Hmm. Uh, so much so that uh, I had this. Re- I, I remember as a kid, I had this re- recording tape device and, and I recorded their first album on it. Mostly because my brothers didn't allow me to borrow their CDs. <laughs> so one day I stole their first album, Third Eye Blind, mm-hmm. and um, I recorded it on on a, you know, this weird you know tape. I think I know what you're talking recorder. about. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. On, on a cassette tape. Yeah. And I listened. I listened to that thing, in my Walkman, and I would <sighs> I would li- I would literally ride around town on my bike and study their music. Uh, and I wore that tape down. And uh, so, yeah, th- th- this is the band that, if you grew up in the 90s, kind of defined nostalgia for you, uh, if, looking back now. So mm-hmm. um, their first album was like Lightning in, in a Bottle. It was probably their, their best one out of all the ones they've done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've, they've, they've done five. Um, and I remember each, each one of their albums really was – it hit me at a unique period of my life. Like I remember the first album came out when I was a kid in Canadian – and around 97 uh, and and that's the first time that like music really started to hit me in a way that I started viewing music as something that was beautiful mm-hmm. even though like looking back it's like third eye blind if you understand some of their lyrics then you're like oh my gosh <laughs> this is terrible <laughs> this is domestic violence but and then, and then like their second album came out in 99 right around the time that like that day of epiphany hit me and I like started noticing girls so uh <laughs> I would write love letters to this this my first crush ever, and shout out. Shout out. And I would I, w- I would like, and I would quote lyrics from this album, "Deep Inside of You," not knowing what the song was actually about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, yeah. So so this band this band has roots with me, and I know it's a silly. Hmm power pop band um but it, you know it's just one of those things that you just grow up with and and you love it um, hey like there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that like yeah so now that you got a little bit of context about about this band for me personally um this album it's it's a forgettable pop, power pop album but that that has a few songs that are like oh that's really good and the rest is just kind of crap really yeah um so, yeah, this album seems really self-aware of where they've come in the last 18 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's been six years since their last album, Ursa Major. Um, and the guy, the, the lead singer, uh, Stephen or Stefan? I can't even remember his name. Stephen uh, Jenkins. He's never going to listen to the show, so I'm sure yeah, he yeah, he, he won't care. He won't care. <laughs> um, he knows his way around a hook. He still, he's still got it when it comes to, to hooks. One. So there, there's really... For me, three three songs on this album that are kind of worth their salt in anything. So, everything is easy. And here's here's a uh, here's a sample of that. So people, whenever they listen to Third Eye Blind, they're really they're really looking for a trip down the memory lane because they they were just pumping out hit after hit after hit in their early career. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know th- this al- this this album, Dopamine, which is the name of the album, uh, which is really strange. <laughs> um, it it provides if it, it provides a few of those like glimpses of what we loved in the earlier stages of this band's career. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then, and there's there's a few songs here that are that work and, and they're melodically accessible, and they have a very unique way of um, of writing because I mean this is literally it's like hook after hook, like 
really catchy verse, really catchy chorus, really catchy bridge, and it's all like layered on top of really powerful uh, guitars. That I, I when I was listening to that because I, I I hadn't listened to the samples of the songs you told me you wanted to to, to use that guitar tone. Was, yeah, yeah, their their, their guitar that, work that guitar has tone. always been really phenomenal. Although they've gone through like three different guitarists. Oh, that's there's it. only there's only two people: the lead singer and the drummer, who are original members of the band. Because apparently the guy's not not very easily the, the lead singer is not very easy to get along with. Oh my gosh! Um, a vocalist for a rock band is not easy to get along <laughs> with. Like say it isn't so. Yeah, yeah, is yeah, kind of a drama queen. But that that's that's the thing that kind of gripped me as a kid, and why 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 people love Third Eye Blind so much is because there's there's like they're gonna kick down the door with their rock and roll heavy guitars, but also it's gonna be v- extremely catchy and it's gonna get in your head, just like this this sample, Shipboard Cook. These songs, they really harken back to the earlier days, and I think I think it's kind of like looking. I think the artists themselves are kind of looking back at what they have done and what they were known for, mm-hmm. and they know that they're not ever going to make an album like their first one. I mean, the uh, the lead singer is now fifty years old, which is really crazy to believe that. I remember seeing them. Um, gosh, was it? It was two years ago. Me, me, and a, a really great friend of mine went to Denver, and because we just grew up with Third Eye Blind, and we we saw them in Denver, and I, I, I was shocked when I heard that he was fifty years old. I, I did that preparing for this show. I was like, he's fifty. That's like in the range of. Uh... So yeah, so there there's some songs here that that really work, and that um, that that harken back to like I was saying what people love them for, which is like really catchy songs with really powerful guitars and, you know, choruses and all that stuff. It's really great. And then there's some songs here that don't work at all. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't want, I don't want to play you this song, but it's called back to zero. It's just a terrible song. It just, <laughs> I can't say really anything good about this song. It's like a weird <laughs> mix of dance music meets like pop music, which, which sounds like it could work, but it just doesn't. Right. Um, but here's the thing. It, it does bear a few more listens before I kind of completely write it off. And they said that this album was their last one, and I hope that they're wrong. I really hope that they're wrong. Do you think they still have some life left in them? Uh, at 50? I don't know. I mean, not that, that that can't happen. Right. But with a band that kind of made their success on, like, <laughs> drugs and rock and roll and sex, like, I yeah. don't know how long that can you know. The rock and roll part. Now it's not rock and roll, drugs and sex. It's EDM, drugs and sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that's that's a really interesting thing. Uh, so they they haven't released any of the lyrics for the, for their this new album yet. So it's really hard to kind of like understand where the songs are going. I know I just by listening to it, they're breakup songs. Which were, first of all, it's really weird to hear a fifty year old singing that's still singing so about weird. breakup songs. It's just really strange. That's just so weird. It's really strange. <laughs> Um, but that's what worked for them in the past. Maybe they're like, Hey, maybe that will work for us now still. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix if it. If it ain't broke. Yeah, exactly. Um, here's one more, here's one more, um, demo of my favorite song on the album. And honestly, it's one that, um, that I think kind of holds up against their older stuff. It's called all these things. Right to birth. Yeah. All these things, all these things are yours. Took us all to better days As you can tell, like people love love this band because of the catchiness and all, honestly, like the, their their lyrics are really, really well thought out. And I think that's why it took him so long to write this album was he mm-hmm. he was he just had a major case of writer's block, um, which I think some people can relate to. Uh, I'm, I'm in a perpetual stake of eternal writer's yeah. block. <laughs> and he had six years to write this album and. Um, I think he kind of dropped the ball, honestly. 
Um, there, there's a few songs here that, like, like I said, that are worth that are worth listening to, and that, and you know, I'm gonna give this this album another run through, uh, for sure. But I don't know if you Maybe. if you were to pin pin a number on it, like at at your present understanding of it, what? Well, maybe not pin an exact number, but like a range. Yeah, because here's the thing about their music that's always stuck with me is like, especially in the, in the early days, is I didn't necessarily think much of it when I first heard it, and then I went back and I kind of I had to study it and kind of let it give some air to breathe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And kind of let it grow on me personally, which I'm gonna do because I, I, I love this band. Um, so this is with room to grow. I guess just I'm gonna I'm gonna put this at a four. Wow, uh, with room to grow. Okay, that's fair. So that that's very fair. I know I had a friend of mine text me the other day. Actually, um, he was listening to the the new Mumford album, and he said that he hated it at first, but it's really grown on him with time. And I was just like, I can't foresee that album growing on me with time at all. But I get the idea. Like there are some albums that I listen to now that when I first heard, I was like, Nah, I'm not feeling this. Like. Mm-hmm. Like so, I totally get it. But a four, dang man, like that's you're, you're not you're not beating around the bush there. No, I'm not. And also, I can't really give credence to people listening to this because <laughs> because their lyrics are so terrible. I mean, <laughs> uh, I remember singing these songs as a kid, not knowing what I was saying, and then I go back and it's like I'm singing about meth and and like he oh goes into gosh. detail about you know his sexual experiences and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe these were heroes of mine. Uh, so I look, I go back and not, not all their stuff, but most, a lot of their hits were about like really happy feeling, sad songs. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's one of those things where you're like, oh my gosh, that's what he was saying the entire time. I've been singing this for years. Um, the but, light, but, the light bulb turns on. The light bulb turns on. Yeah. But, but what I, when I mean like the connectiveness of it, there are some lyrics that he has in, in his work that are really, really deep and really, really great. And the rest are just like, oh my gosh, this is vulgar. <laughs> <So. laughs> yeah, that, I think this I think this album will actually tie in really well to our main course and yeah, tie into yeah, what, what, we're, what, what we're talking about. Uh, next week, we're at least as far as we are concerned, there is really not much coming out. Breaking Benjamin has an album coming out. I only put that in there because everybody knows who Breaking Benjamin is. And then John Mark and Sarah McMillan have an EP coming out called You Are the Avalanche. Which I did not know this was coming. I, I love John Mark McMillan, and I did not know this was coming. This is a surprise. I, I selfishly, and, and you can tell me if this is a genius idea or if I'm just thinking too much here. Maybe John Mark McMillan's rendition of the Civil Wars? Oh, that'd be interesting. That would be, oh man, I would be all over that. Just because I miss the Civil War so much. You know, I, I think I missed that ship. I never got onto them. What? Yeah. No way. Oh, man. Their first yeah. album is like, oh, man. I love that album. <laughs> Such a beautiful album. Well, let's get into uh, our main course. So we're going to talk about a dead guy. We're going to talk about a, a guy who's been dead for 500 years, 400 years. It's a long time, though. A long time. Uh, a long time ago, and just not in a galaxy far, far away. So, John Calvin. <laughs> and, and your your response is either, oh, sweet, John Calvin, or really, John Calvin. <laughs> yeah. There's really not much in the way of middle ground when it comes to, to the name John Calvin. You, you really either just kind of love him or strongly detest him. <laughs> <laughs> But he has a quote in his mammoth, mammoth, mammoth work, uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, which we've been working through that for, for what, the past year almost? Like, Yeah, I think it has been almost a year. It, it's been almost a year since, since we started doing that, and we're not even halfway through it yet. And we've been moving probably about the pace of close to a chapter, maybe a ch- two chapters a week. Yeah, we're probably not even halfway through it a year later. It's so big. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so big. But he has a quote in in this book, uh, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is a great, great read. Like, seriously, it's even even if you're not a Calvinist, because I know that's a hot-button topic for, for people, this is still a book to read because his he has such a high view of the Bible in this. He has such a high treatment of the Scripture in this. You You can't not like it. 
like when he gets on a roll when it comes to quoting Bible passages, he just links scriptures together, just bam, 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 and it's beautiful. And I could go on a rant about this all day long. Uh, but no, his quote. Uh, would you like to read this this quote, or do you want me to? Why don't you go ahead and read it? I will go ahead because I'll probably stumble over my words. I've I've read through it a lot in pre- preparation for this show, but I, I wish I wish Brett was here because Brett could do his fake French accent and read this <laughs> in the fr- fake French accent. So this is coming from book number two, uh, chapter two, point number fifteen. Whenever we come upon these matters in secular writers, let that admirable light of truth shining in them teach us that the mind of man, though fallen and perverted from its wholeness, is nevertheless clouded and ornamented with God's excellent gifts. If we regard the Spirit of God as the sole fountain of truth, we shall neither reject the truth itself nor despise it wherever we shall appear, unless we wish to dishonor the Spirit of God. For by holding the gifts of the Spirit in slight esteem, we contemn and reproach the Spirit himself. What then shall we deny that the truth shown upon the ancient jurist who established civic order and discipline with such great equity? Shall we say that the philosophers were blind in their fine observance of the artful description of nature? Shall we say that those men were devoid of understanding who conceived the art of of disputation and taught us to speak reasonably? Shall we say that they are insane who developed medicine and developing, devoting their labor to our benefit? What shall we say of the, all the mathematical sciences? Shall we regard them as the ravings of a madman? No, we can't read the writings of these ancients on these subjects without great admiration. We marvel at them because we are compelled to recognize how preeminent they are. But we shall count anything praiseworthy or noble without recognizing at the same time that it comes from God? Let us be ashamed of such an ingratitude, into which not even the pagan poets fell. For they confessed that the gods had invented philosophy, laws, and all useful arts. Those men whose scripture calls natural men were, indeed, sharp and penetrating into their investigation of inferior things. Let us accordingly, then, learn by their example how many gifts the Lord has left to human nature even after it was despoiled of its true good. All right, let's just wrap up the episode. Like, let's just <laughs> drop the mic. Let's just drop the mic and walk, walk away. So, yeah. I love this th- this particular quote because I, it uh, really ties into kind of the whole purpose of this podcast. Because we can't listen to a band like Third Eye Blind, and I think this would actually be a, a, a decent example here. We can't listen to a band that has talent, that has creativity. What you know, third eye blind, or the ongoing concept. I mean, actually, the ongoing concept really, really shines at this po- at this point too, uh, and not be amazed at at what they've done. But we, it, it would be wrong to say that. Oh well, because you know, third eye blind, they're they're their lead vocalist. I take it is not a believer. No, probably not. I, I, I doubt. It. No, I, he's I, not. I, <laughs> well, I, you know, at this point, I think we're left with enough evidence to say no. Probably okay. not. Yeah, but he, but this guy who is not a believer, very sh- as Calvin says, sharp and penetrating in their investigation of inferior things, and then let us learn by their example, like what that means for us as musicians, and what that means as people who who consume and process entertainment. That there there is the freedom in in the Christian worldview and in Christ, uh, from whom all good gifts extend from. Whether that's you know. Being able to play the guitar well, or being able to write power pop lyrics over the span of six years, <laughs> God has the Lord has left gifts to to us, even though we have despoiled them of those true goods. And there's freedom in that. There's there's a lot of freedom in that to like listen to a band like like Third Eye Blind, and note what good things are there. Yeah, it, it's so very useful uh, and so very helpful and very freeing uh, that. Because there's this monk in her, and I, and I know we've said this on the show two million times, you know, that depending upon what sector of Christendom you may find yourself in, you know, listening to bands that are not Christian or, you know, do not openly glorify God or uh, or even, even listening to bands that take open stances against God is, is kind of frowned upon. But I think Calvin may actually disagree with that. Uh, and and, mm. and you and we can testify just reading Calvin like how many times he quotes just all of these uh the, these obscure people throughout history like disprovingly so like he's familiar with their stuff even though it's wrong and he says but like these these guys had something to say they're wrong but they said it pretty dang good 
mm-hmm. and, and pretty dang convincingly. Like, I, like that's just like my my thoughts on it. What do you think? Like, like yeah, on this? um, I I think you're right, man. I think this. I I just remember growing up in in a Christian culture, um, and we were I was told like everything in the secular air quotes used world, everything in the secular world is bad. Everything in the Christian world is good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we suppressed culture outside culture and we kind of like made this Christian hub, uh, that just kind of turned into the most ridiculous thing ever. Um, <laughs> and we said, everything in the world's bad. Stay away from that. Everything in, in, in the Christian world is good. So we had our own music. We had our own literature. We had our own movies that we could and couldn't watch. And I think that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I think it's ridiculous. I, I think there there is some wisdom in like shielding your kids away from like things you don't want them to get into. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, but 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 I think a lot, for those who hear my words, they they can understand maybe where I'm coming from. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think the gospel allows us to to like it, it, well, Jesus told us to be lights in the darkness, um, to be in the world but not of the world. Yes. Um, and that being said, like. Once I actually started listening to secular music, air, again, if, air we quotes, could, if we could use that word, uh, we uh, once I started listening to other with other genres of music, other kinds of music, bands like Third Eye Blind, where I I was I always felt a little guilty as a little Christian kid, like listening to 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 <laughs> listening to I didn't really know what I was listening to, right? But uh, <laughs> going back, like there there are some things like I, you know, watching rated R movies and all this stuff, and and there's there's beauty in so much of it, and and also, like, oh, this is really hard to actually articulate. Articulate, yeah. But there, okay, so I have this. I have this thing here that I want to kind of bring up. So this is a great place in the Book of Acts, Acts seventeen, actually, mm. where Paul is at uh, he's I know, I know a sermon at Mars Hill, and um, and he uses a a pagan Stoic philosopher his poem to illuminate the beauty of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what he does is he contextualizes the gospel. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who are like, ah, screw you, contextualization. Yeah, yeah. But I, w- I would say, well, we have biblical evidence for it, I think. I, I, yes, definitely. Well, and even in going back to the quote from Calvin, uh, if we regard the spirit of God as the sole fountain of truth, which, pause pause the quote here, all truth is God's truth. Like, he is the author of truth. Yeah. Uh, he, he is the sole fountain of truth. Uh, resume quote, he shall, we, we shall neither reject the truth itself nor despise it where it shall appear, unless we want to dishonor the Spirit of God. Like, that's a pretty bold idea that if we despise something that is true just because it's coming from a non-Christian, mm-hmm. uh, Calvin would say that that's dishonoring to the Spirit of God, like that that's dishonoring to God because that truth that that non-Christian holds to and maybe is singing about or writing about, that came from God. <laughs> And so you're dishonoring God by by not paying attention to that truth. So there there's so many different things to take here with this. I think mainly the big thing here, like because I grew up in the same thing too as well. Uh, I remember listening to Switchfoot and feeling guilty, man. Like really, yeah. Like I remember listening like listening to Switchfoot, and I'm like, I, I had to ask my mom, like, Mom, is it okay for me to listen to Switchfoot? <laughs> Wow. So let that sink in. Well, and, and you know, it, w- w- with the heavy handedness of all that, like I've seen it burn out a lot of people and they yes. just completely like leave. They, they completely abandon lo- the local church altogether because they're just so burnt out. It's a very serious thing. And I, I would honestly say like before I knew this quote existed, that what he's hitting at here and that burning out that you've talked about, I, I've been there. And I think... I could say that another ascending lark, like when it was birthed, it was birthed it at me in a burnout on, on this subject. Like I, I had like just gotten really burnt out of this, you know, oh, we can only listen to Christian music, you know, or, oh yeah, you know, he, you know, secular artists, you know, they might be able to play the guitar well or sing well or write songs well, but that stuff's not really good because they don't worship Jesus. Uh, and, and I think I think this all really kind of began for me on a, on the back of a burnout. And I would say that I've really come out of that burnout quite a bit since then, as you know, I listen to quite a bit of secular music nowadays, but that, yeah, that, that whole burnout thing, like I've seen that happen so many times. And I think it's because, and we've played this card before. It's an issue of discipleship. Mm -hmm. It's an issue of, of discipling Christians on how to consume, how to consume music, like Mm -hmm. how to listen to music because so, so let me ask you this: Did your dad, uh, did your dad know about Third Eye Blind 
Like, no, I kept it from him. Okay, you kept um, it from him. I just because I remember him vividly uh, breaking a corn CD in my brother's faces when they're they like, "You're not gonna listen to corn," and he broke the CD in their faces. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I know it was really weird for me as a kid. <laughs> oh my that. gosh! Um, I just knew that. Whoever corn is, stay away from corn. Um, and I, I'm, I don't mean to make my, make my father sound dogmatic because he no. really wasn't that dogmatic. He just he he knew and he heard the rumors about corn and yeah. all that stuff. And well, back it, it was it, really funny. I back in the day, too. I mean, corn even. I mean, really, even present corn. Even with uh, Brian Head Welch uh, uh, now being back in the band as a Christian, corn back in the day was pretty messed up. They were pretty messed. up. <laughs> they were pretty messed up. Yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, like just that kind of, uh, you know, we have our camp and we don't go play in the other camp. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which is like, how can we be in the world and of the, you know, in the world and in the light of the world, you know, being the light of the world, if we never interact with the world? Mm-hmm. <laughs> how, how can we do that if we don't know what's going on in the world? If, if we're living in our, inside our own contextualized world? bubble, which I, I think the Christian music industry in particular has done a really good job of creating this culture where we have the, the Christian equivalent of corn. We have probably three or four Christian equivalents of third eye blind. We have, you know, did, did you, you, I don't ever remember seeing one of these, but apparently they existed like in Christian bookstores back in the day where they had the, the chart that said, if you like this artist, then you'll like this artist. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. And it, and that's what I hate about Christian music. <laughs> it's just like, if I, if I want somebody that sounds like this artist, I'm going to go listen to that artist. Right? I, don't, I don't want some knockoff with, you know, you tag the word Jesus to it and it's going to be, it's going to be like, Oh, it's better now. Cause Jesus is in it. Yeah. No, I don't want some knockoff. I'm just going to, I'll, does that make sense? Yeah. No, no, no. That's exact. It makes exact sense like that. And that's, Oh my, like that has been the case now for, for such a long time. Things are changing. Like we are starting to see musicians and we are starting to see bands and artists arise that are giving, you know, the secular community uh, a run for its money. Like there are some really good artists who are Christians, maybe not playing in like the Christian scene per se, but who are breaking down that mold because, and, and I've said this before on the show, like early on in the show, and I've, uh, Soften my views over time on this, but the the Christian market either not like it needs to radically reform or it just needs to disappear. It, like, I think disintegrating is probably the best thing for it because it, it we 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 cause more separation than anything else. Exactly. Um, like we're different from you. You know, we're not going to drink alcohol because alcohol's part of the world. We're not going to listen to Lady Gaga because Lady Gaga's part of the world. You know. Lady Gaga was a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> Although, did you see her uh, her her Sound of Music performance? I didn't. I bet it was amazing, though. She's I, a, she's incredible. I, Can I just say that she's incredible. Okay, so I may have mentioned this on the show. I can't. We're getting to the point now. I I don't remember everything. I like we were thirty eight episodes now. I don't remember everything on every episode. But uh, yeah, her Sound of Music performance. I think it was at the Oscars. I've never said a single positive thing about Lady Gaga in my life up until that point. Blew me away. We're totally going on a tangent here. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, like, you know, Lady Gaga is in the world, therefore she's automatically bad. That's one of the things I like about Francis Schaeffer and art and art in the Bible is that he kind of piggybacks on Calvin here without actually like piggybacking on Calvin explicitly uh, and sets up a system for evaluating art where we can praise what's good about Lady Gaga because Lady Gaga is talented. She mm-hmm. she can sing. Oh my gosh, she can sing. And I didn't know that until I yeah. saw her Sound of Music performance. Blew me out of the water. I was speechless. Yeah, and it's just evidence that creation tells of the greatness of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I and for me personally, I don't see it as much in music. I, I mean, I know it's there, but for me, I, I've seen it more in writing mm-hmm. and in some of the books I've read. And for specifically guys like Cormac McCarthy. Oh my gosh. Um, yes. And David Foster Wallace. Um, if you know who that is, but yeah, especially Cormac McCarthy, like he, he's not a Christian. He no. wrestles a lot with, uh, with religious religion themes. and, yeah, religious and Christianity themes. specifically. But like I've, 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 I can read parts of, of his writing and I can be moved to glorify God in it. Just because of the beauty of his words. And yeah. it's like, does that make sense? No, absolutely. I, um, I, I, Absolutely, and I think I think that's a good thing because yeah. it, it's 
we, I think we really do have to, and I, I know at this point we're probably just speaking to the choir here. Uh, we, we've got to get past this this Christian, non-Christian mindset. I mean, I've, I, I do not believe that Christian music exists. I, I do not accept it as a legitimate category of music. I think it is a misunderstanding based on what music is, for one thing. And then as a label, it, it's... I can't think of a label more unhelpful than Christian music. I, I mean, I really can't. Mm. I, I can't think of something that's more vague, more undefined, and has caused more unnecessary strife and legalism and division than than Christian music. Because I mean, it, it's it's pervasive. It's it's everywhere. We still have this mindset where not not we as per se like you and I, but there this mindset really still is prevalent where you know. Christians listen to Christian music. Non-Christians listen to non-Christian music. Like, just this kind of black and white look at how the world is, but that's not how the world works. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I've known just from testimony after testimony of people who were the most adamant at, like, loving Jesus, and they would tell me, like, you only need to listen to Christian music. Only oh. listen to Christian music and see what happens. Like, try it for three months and see what happens. I've told that to people. I, I, have, uh, I have told that to people. Yeah, and and even at that time, I was like, man, that 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 sounds weird. Uh, not not just weird, but almost there, there's an underlining uh, motivation behind that. Mm-hmm. And some of those people who told me that would not claim Christ anymore. Yeah. No, I, I definitely did say that to people uh, when I was in high school. I, I remember, and I will never forget this, just because... So I, I got a computer for Christmas one year, and my dad copied over his music library from his computer to, to this one, and he had things that I didn't have access to. Uh, and my dad, you know, was a classic rock guy. He's got a lot of Bruce Springsteen. Uh, he's got a lot of Bruce Springsteen and a lot of Tom Petty. Uh, but th- there were also some other things in there that I did not – I just didn't know that he had on his computer, basically. And it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Like, it wasn't, like, you know, explicit, like, hip-hop or anything like that, you know, or stuff that's just really vulgar or dirty. But – it was, oh gosh, what was the what was that one of the albums in particular? It was a Van Halen album. That's what it was. And I remember one time, like, like after getting this computer and seeing all this new music at my disposal, like I had to like wrestle one afternoon, like, do I keep this music on my computer? And in frustration, I, I deleted it. Like everything that was not a Christian artist, I deleted. And this was back in like two thousand nine, so this wasn't too terribly long ago. And I remember afterwards just the immense frustration because I wanted to listen to Van Halen. I wanted to listen to Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I wanted to listen to these guys because they're good. But I felt like I'm a Christian. I can't listen to these guys because they're not Christians. You know, they, they sing about stuff that, that Jesus doesn't like. You know, they, they sing about stuff that doesn't glorify God, so I can't listen to them. And, and I, I've since, you know, obviously I've had a reverse 180 to like, yes, I can listen. You know, we can listen to lady gaga or you know you could you could fill in the blank but then turn around and say that they're wrong and that's okay (laughs) yeah oh man we could we could go at this we could uh and and i wanted to kind of like elaborate more on that just i I have this awesome quote here i don't know if we have enough time to no go for it go for it um it's it's from david foster wallace and he he was uh he's he was an atheist um who committed suicide um but he may, he 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 was a he's a pretty famous um, poet, mm-hmm. and he 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 wrote this little blurb here about, uh, and again this is a, this is an atheist, and listen to what his words are saying about what how he views the world, okay okay listen to this and this is this this will blow your mind he goes, whatever your worship and again this so he he's gonna he's gonna give a side of an atheist so obviously I disagree with him but what the things that he's saying here are so like I think a Christian could understand this and uh, and see the beauty of Christ in it. Yeah. So here's what he's saying. He goes, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap your real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never, uh, never feel like you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they can finally plant you on one level. We all know this stuff already. It's been confided in myths and proverbs and cliches and parables, the skeletons of every great story. The trick is to keep the truth in front in daily consciousness. Worship power, and you feel weak and afraid. 
and you'll, you will need ever more power over others to keep your fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always at the verge of being found out, and so on and so on. End quote. But he was just he was just tapping into like this is an atheist. That's really he, he's talking. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, and uh, yeah, an atheist who killed himself. He hung himself. Uh, but he's he's he was he he gave this speech at a commencement, a graduated commencement at a university somewhere. Oh my god! Uh, and he was talking about this idea of worship and what it is. And he was like, whatever you worship is going to eat you up. You're going to become like it. Even, even even an atheist can grasp onto the truth of what the gospel is saying. And that truth came like. Even though he was an atheist, that that truth came from from God. Mm-hmm. That that truth came from God. Like the, the Spirit of God is a sole fountain of truth, and we shall neither reject the truth itself nor despise it where it shall appear, even if it's from an atheist who hung himself. Yeah, obviously he didn't see the hope in worshiping uh, the God of all creation, <laughs> right? Uh, which it, which is the key here. But he did grasp that whatever you do worship, it's going to eat you alive. That is. Dang, that was a great quote. That was a really, really, yeah. really good quote. But no, that I think that's like I think that's a, like a practical, like an amazing practical application of like what we've been talking about. Like, you don't have to forget the fact for a second that this guy was an atheist. Is what he's saying true? And if the answer to that question is yes, where did that truth come from? If it came from God, we need to. If it came from God, and all truth does come from God. Why would we reject it just because it came from an atheist? Why why would we reject it because it came from somebody who didn't worship God? It's not his truth. He didn't make it up. Mm-hmm. He he didn't he can't take credit for that because he's not the one who who made it true. God was the one who made it true. Yeah. There is an absolute truth that even non-believers can grasp onto. Mhm. There there is a standard for and there there's a standard for morality. There's a standard for right and wrong. There's a standard for goodness. We were talking about that earlier in in uh community group earlier that there is a that God is the standard for these things, and he is the source for, for these things, and he is the source of truth. And he alone determines what is true and what is not true. Yeah. And that truth has been revealed in Jesus Christ. That truth has been made known to us in Jesus Christ, the the, the word made flesh. And, oh, man, we could, we could go on this, like, for forever and ever and ever. Um, all that to say is because we could go on this forever. If we, and if you're a listener to the show or if this is your first episode— Know that like this is something this show is passionate about is is breaking down those walls that separate us from being lights of the world when it comes to music lovers. We we love music and we want to enable Christians and empower Christians to better interact with their friends and their family members and their coworkers whenever they're talking about music. And we want people to think about music because like I like I said earlier, like the problems that we're having as Christians in the you know Christians who listen to music and, you know, the existence of the Christian music industry, it all stems from, from poor discipleship. It, that's, that's the source of the problem is that we don't disciple Christians correctly and properly on these matters. And as much as the show is able, we want to like reverse that, that trajectory and reverse that course, because there's so much joy to, to be had. There is so much joy to be had in listening to music from non-Christians guys. And that's a totally okay thing to grasp. Yeah. Like that, there's nothing wrong with deriving joy from the music of non-believers and seeing it for the good thing that it is. That's a good thing from God to be able to see something that's good and recognize it as so. That that's proof that we're functioning correctly, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but man, we could we could definitely go on this all day. Go read John Calvin, people. Like go like that was book two, chapter two, point fifteen. Uh, that whole chapter is really good and really beneficial and and really helpful. So let's get into recos. What are you? Uh, what are you going to be recoing today? For... I'm going to reco that you reco first. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that ain't right. Because I'm still like thinking through like what I'm going to reco. Dang it. Um. Ah oh, no. Dang it. I I was hoping that you would say something and that would trigger something in me. Well, but... I actually, have something. So. Okay. It, I I recommend. I reco. That you all uh, observe Juneteenth this what weekend. Is, what is Juneteenth? Explain so Juneteenth. it is the it is a celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation and the the the, the freedom of slaves. Okay. And that announcement was brought in Galveston, Texas, actually, by a name a guy. His last name is Granger. 
Um, but it, they announced he, it first in Galveston, Texas. So is this guy related to like Hermione Granger? I mean, it might be. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> I had to go there. <laughs> okay, so I would say uh, if you find yourself, and here's the thing: like a lot of African Americans celebrate this, and not not a lot of other people celebrate this. I don't uh-huh. really understand that, but. Um, if you find yourself like uh, if you have a chance to attend a service or something like that, that it's being celebrated, why don't you check it out or even just read up on it? How about that? How about get some information about what Juneteenth is? It's worth celebrating for sure. When, and um, it's and it's this Saturday? It is this Saturday. It's being celebrated on the 20th, but it's actually June, June 19th is when it's annually celebrated. So your advice then will be applicable next year because the show gets published on Monday. Oh, <laughs> Dang. How about, okay, so 365 days from now, <laughs> celebrate Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Okay, because I've been, been hearing, like, Juneteenth, and I had no idea what it is. So now I know, and that's awesome, and that makes sense, and that, that's really, really cool. That, that's really, really awesome. Uh, I am going to reco. We're, we're just going to go here just because, just because you, you, you didn't intentionally do this, but we're just going to go here. I'm going to reco staying off Twitter or Facebook for heated discussions on certain social situations. And if you're reading between the lines, I am referring to the shooting that happened in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, North Carolina, which Carolina? It was in South. South. Charleston, South Carolina. That's what, that's what I thought. My geography is not all that great. And I reckon this like, not like, you know, looking down on those who do but just just as a matter of wisdom um really like the the proverbs like really speak on highly of someone who like will restrain uh their their thoughts or their their tongue in the midst of a heated situation if you have something to say like i mean i'm not going to tell you to not say it or anything like that but just just as a suggestion think before you that's my reco think before you post yeah especially <laughs> especially on social media there's a great guy who i forgot his name but he's he said this he goes that the internet is a friend to information but an enemy of thought it really is um it, it's not a place for you to uh, well it is what we turned it into but it's not a great place to give your opinion most of the time mm-hmm. especially on twitter like like twitter is twitter is fun Really, Twitter is a very is just fun, and it's good for gathering information. You cannot have a serious discussion about racial tension in America, or you know, hate crimes based on race with 140 characters. You you can't like that's just not possible. Especially okay, I'm gonna say this. Go for it. Especially if you're white. Okay. If you if you are a Caucasian or Hispanic male, mm-hmm. you have no right saying anything about the African American community. It's because you weren't you didn't live it. So shut your mouth. It, I, I will not challenge that. I, I, so I will not challenge that. I agree with that. I absolutely will agree with that. And so think before you post. And yeah, this, you want to talk about like discipleship, like failures in discipleship. Yeah, like, no kidding. <laughs> um, I'm going to wreck of something else that's not serious and like, you know, not super serious and super heady. What should I, what should I wreck of? Oh, did I wreck of the Santa Fe? It, it, Imperial Java Stout. You did, yeah. Dang it! So you did. Dang it! Um, crap. Uh, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> I guess my only record this week is going to be like super weighty and like really, really heavy and intense. But oh well. Let's get into question of the week. Uh, <laughs> question of the week. Let's get into the question of the week. We still need to get a soundbite for this. So question we, of the week. Yeah, we need to get some kind of type of soundbite for this. So. Uh, we asked, what album brings you the most nostalgia and why? Well, I got two responses this week, but you know what? We just rolled this out, so we certainly understand that, you know, we're not reading 10 million different responses. Kirby Hubbard said the Top Gun soundtrack. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And that's I read really that, good. and I was like, dang, that's a great answer. Like, yeah. that's a fantastic answer. He said it was his first CD ever, so, you know, going back to, like, you know, the very first album that he ever heard. Uh, 
Yeah, Top Gun soundtrack. That's not bad. And then he also added Reliant K's Mm-hmm and Under Oaths, They're Only Chasing Safety, uh, as two albums he really listened to uh, back in high school and kind of took him back to high school, which the Reliant K album was is excellent. That's a great, great, great album. Andrew Akins said Weatherman by Gregory Allen Isakov. Uh, back, uh, he was listening to that back when he became a Christian, back when he... Uh, back when he decided to, to follow Jesus. So takes him, takes him back to those, uh, those days of conversion. I don't remember what those days were like because I was a kid. Uh, it was a long, long time ago. So what album brings you the most nostalgia? You know, okay, so uh, spoiler alert, it's the third eye blind album. <laughs> I was, I, I was it's, wondering. It's the very first third eye blind album that came out. Third Eye Blind. Because you were pretty detailed about that in the beginning. And I was like, man, how is he going to top this one? <laughs> well, if, okay, so here's here's another thing. This is a really, this is a really stupid story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Uh, so the Braveheart soundtrack. Hmm. So Braveheart, my brothers loved Braveheart, so they play, They always had it playing. And I've, I've seen it probably 40 times. Mm-hmm. And this is really dumb and really embarrassing, but I'm going to tell this story anyway. What I used to do <laughs> is I used to listen to the Braveheart soundtrack when I was a kid. Like in third grade, it came out in '95. I don't know what age I was at that time, but I, I would listen to it in my room by myself, and I would cry because <laughs> it's so emotional. The bagpipes, it's so emotional. So I would, I would literally lock myself in my room and listen to the Braveheart soundtrack and cry. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. To that. <laughs> so anytime I, I see that movie, I actually have it. I, I have a list, uh, a playlist on Spotify. It's all my favorite movie soundtracks, and that is on the top of the list. Is the Braveheart theme song? <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. You can, we'll probably have to cut that out later. But <laughs> I don't even know how to process this. <laughs> I, this is amazing. That's actually really, really <laughs> wow. I appreciate your 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 candidness there. there I appreciate your, yeah. your honesty. This this response of mine is probably going to be the most controversial thing I may or may not have ever said on the show. And if Brett were here, he would absolutely he would he would stand up and he'd probably murder me. One of which, which album brings you the most nostalgia and why? There's two albums. The first one is Pillars. Where do we go from here? That was uh, I remember. Having that CD going down to my uncle's wedding, uh, I, I'll I'll just preface this too that like this one just has a lot of significance. Like there's plenty of other albums that bring me I would actually say maybe even more nostalgia, but none of them bring this particular flavor of nostalgia. Uh, where I was not really listening to music at the time, I hadn't had that that moment where I started to enjoy music. I really didn't start listening to music until I was in fifth grade. Uh, I just didn't care for music up until probably fifth grade. And there were two albums that really uh, got me into music. And the first one was Pillars, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, which is still a really good album. But I only listened to the first three songs. I just listened to them over and over and over again. I just really enjoyed it. The other album was the very first Casting Crowns album. No judgment, man. I, I know no judgment from you. Did you lock yourself in a room and cry to the album? When you put it like that, <laughs> when you put it like that, I mean, no, I did not do that. But I the, like these, like the two albums that I ever first liked. One of them was a Pillar album, and then the other was a Casting Crowns album. Uh, those two albums really just take me back to those days when I was just really like getting into music for the very first time in my life. So yeah, uh, other honorable nods include Isley's The Valley. And Opeth's Watershed, and there's a bunch of albums. I'm a very nostalgic person when it comes to albums. Like, yeah. they're Damn the Torpedoes, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which is also, honestly one of my favorite albums of all time. That's a great, that, that's um, a good album. I think of White Deer <laughs> so much when I listen to that thing. I, I think Flyleaf's Memento Mori takes me back to when we moved to Claude. Uh, I was, I love that album, is still phenomenal. Um, Coheed and Cambria's Coheed and Cambria's Oh yeah The Afterman Part 2 uh, I, I was listening to that uh, MXPX Punk Rock Show Oh yes MXPX Man yeah, yeah. we could Like we could go on and on and on Like as Like nostalgia moments Like I would say like Within the last five years of my life I could I, I have Especially for my very first summer Out at the camp That must not be named 
I probably have like 15 albums that will immediately like just take me back to that point of time in my, in, in my life. So we could do nostalgia albums all day long. Next week's question. Next week's question. So if you could pick one band to come out of hiatus, not out of retirement, not, not out of retirement, but out of hiatus, there is a difference. Who would you pick and why? We're not talking about like a band that has broken up, you know, that's called it quits, that's done getting back together. We're talking about a band that's just said, you know what? We can't make music for the time being. We're not breaking up or anything, but we're just going to take a break. Who would you pick and why? So next week, uh, Harry Manilow. <laughs> no, I think he's actually still performing. <laughs> I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he's still, he's still out there. And did he ever really go on hiatus? No, I was say, I don't, never, he never has. I don't think, I don't that think he ever not stopped. He yeah. hasn't wrote any new music either. No, he hasn't. But he why, to. why would you need to write new music when everything that you have to write on is better than, everything else that's coming out yeah no kidding <laughs> so yeah so uh find us on facebook at uh, another ascending lark you can tweet us at aal blog or just send us an email and we will get your responses read on the next episode uh wow this was a this is a one of the longer episodes we've had in a long time we're at uh we're at an hour and in, in nearly an hour and ten so aaron thanks for taking time out of your week to to do the show and for for uh Having plenty of awesome things to say as always. Like you had, you had so much variety to the show. I really do appreciate. Thanks. I feel it. like I was stumbling over everything I was saying today, but thank oh, you. Oh, <laughs> dude, you you're you're on top of things as always. Uh, thank you so much. And we always want to take time to mention the gospel at the end of every episode. But I think we really have covered the gospel pretty well, like in this episode. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard not to talk about it. it it's hard not to talk about the gospel when in, in this episode. So normally, like depending upon the subject, we'll we'll flesh out the gospel as it pertains to what we're talking about. But I think we did a decent job in that in this episode. So thanks for listening, guys. Like thank you again for for tuning in. Yet another week to the closing track. Get a hold of us on Facebook or Twitter. Share the show with your friends and family and coworkers and from the from, from the unbeliever next door, you know. He needs to stop listening to secular podcasts. He needs to start listening to Christian podcasts because, you know, that's gonna that's gonna save his soul, you know. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, follow us and get a hold of us and listen to the show. Thank you for listening. Y'all have a wonderful and fantastic week. Even though we haven't had beer on the show in several weeks, we haven't. No. Uh, we need to. We need to remedy that. We need to remedy that really soon. Yeah, we do. We need to remedy that when we have certain friends of ours from Nashville on, um, because they they said that they would probably be drinking wine on the show, which we have not had wine. Really, on. I thought she seems more of a whiskey girl, but I asked them about wine, and they said wine. So we'll, we'll just have to see. Okay.